I have an unusual message for Resurrection Sunday. Anybody that knows me knows that I, I'm not your standard preacher. I'm not the kind of preacher that just always, uh, you know, for certain holidays I'm going to preach on certain passages uh, regarding that holiday. It is related to the resurrection, of course, but it is a text that I'm sure many churches and many preachers will not be using today. But this is the message that God has placed on my heart for this Resurrection Sunday. I think you'll find it uplifting and inspirational. I hope you will. I hope God will help me to present it in a fashion that you'll be able to find it uplifting and inspirational. Amen. If you'll join me today in the Word of God, in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. Yeah, looky there, I didn't have you go to the Gospels. I didn't have you go to some portion of Scripture that deals with the resurrection story. No. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to read today verses 12 through verse 28. I want to talk to us this afternoon on the topic, Not at all miserable. Hallelujah. Not at all miserable. I know that doesn't sound like a resurrection topic, but I promise you it is. Amen. The reason I'm not at all miserable is because He is risen. Hallelujah. He is risen. And because He is risen, I am not at all miserable. Praise the name of the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning at verse 12 and reading through verse 28. The word of the Lord reads today from the King James text. Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is vain also. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. Listen to verse 19. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, By man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits. Afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, whom he shall have put down, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and all power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, 
it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him, that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 28. If you bow your heads with me another moment, let's go to the Lord once again with a word of prayer. Father, we love you, God. We thank you, Lord, for the wonderful resurrection spirit that we feel today in this place. And I'm certain, God, that those who have joined us by reason of the Internet also are experiencing and sensing and enjoying the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus Christ. God, you are not affected by time. You're not affected by distance. The Word of God declares where two or three are gathered together. In my name, there am I in the midst of them. Lord, we have a quorum in this room today, but more importantly, by reason of the Internet, we have a quorum. Many have come together to join with us that we might in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ remember and recall the benefits and the hope of glory that we have because our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ is in fact and indeed risen from the dead. Anoint Master today the messenger of God. Help me to preach the word of God. Lord, if any preacher on this planet understands God that Preaching must be accompanied by the anointing of the Holy Ghost. If there's any preacher in this world that understands this truth, Lord, you know that it is I. I claim no gift. I claim no talent. I claim no ability. Oh God, if I'm going to be faithful, if I'm going to be effective today in bringing to God's people what you've laid on my heart for this hour, I need the touch of God, I need the anointing of the Holy Ghost, I need the Spirit of God to ride upon my words and to confirm in the hearing and in the heart of every hearer that that which they hear is indeed a word from heaven for their soul. Master, grant it this hour, touch the hearer as well, for we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful name, Amen. amen. Praise God and amen. I have attached an unusual title to my Resurrection Sunday message today, and I, I often do that. Anybody who knows me knows that my Christmas titles, my Easter titles, so-called, my Resurrection titles are often unusual and people say well what in the world does that have to do with the holiday at hand well what it has to do today is with the fact that we live in a miserable world God created this world and he created it perfect he created it beautiful he created it sinless and man fouled everything up. Adam messed everything up. All of a sudden, the world took on a whole new nature and it took on a whole new uh, tenor. As Satan became the prince and power of the air, he became, as it were, the god of this world. We know according to the word of God, there's not but one god. We understand that, but... The Word of God says He is the God of this world. That means He has predominance and He has power and dominion over this world. But then the Word of God also tells us, For God so loved, what? The world. That He gave His only begotten Son. That whosoever, hallelujah, believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Hallelujah. You see, i got news for you, folks. 
it, Jesus did not come simply because God loved humanity. Listen to me now, this is important. Jesus did not come to earth. God Himself did not robe Himself in humanity so that He could go to the cross, He could be buried in a tomb, and He could stop on the grave simply because He loved the human race. No, 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 no. For God so loved the world. He loved the entirety of His creation. And it was the entirety of His creation that was forfeited and that was lost by Adam in the garden. The Word of God declares that the Garden of Eden, the word Eden literally translates pleasures. The word Eden in the Hebrew literally means pleasures. It was a garden of pleasures. It was pleasurable to look at the flowers and the trees. It was pleasant to the smell senses, the aromas, the perfumes of the flowers and the plants. It was pleasant to the touch. It was pleasant to the taste. Everything in the garden was pleasurable. The Word of God declares that God hath given us all things to enjoy. You see, God created this world for humanity. He created it for us. Everything that He created, He created so that we could enjoy it and we could derive pleasure from it. Well, when man forfeited his dominion in the Garden of Eden to Lucifer the serpent, then Lucifer the serpent, Satan, became the prince and power of the air. He became the god of this world, the one with supreme authority over this world. And God said, I love that world I created too. I didn't just create humanity. I created that world for humanity. I'm going to tell you something. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, not only would humanity ultimately be lost, but we would destroy this planet. Anybody who knows anything about the nuclear race and anybody who knows anything about the human race and the direction that we've been going for the last many, many decades understands that we possess within us today the ability to literally destroy not only ourselves but the entire planet. We have the ability in our hands today to destroy everything good, to destroy every plant, to destroy every animal, to destroy every good and pleasant thing that exists on the face of planet earth. The word of God said that except God should shorten the days concerning the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, he said no flesh should be saved. That's not just humanity. That means all kinds of flesh. The Bible tells us there is some flesh of birds and some flesh of beasts of the field and some flesh of fish and humans have another kind of flesh. But it's all flesh. And except God should shorten the days, humanity, as sure as I'm alive, humanity would destroy everything and everyone on this planet. But God loved His creation so much that He gave or He offered His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. In the first century church, there were already those who had crept into the church of the living God and were trying to sow seeds of doubt and false doctrine, they were trying to suggest that resurrection from the dead was an impossibility. It did not happen. Do you know there are cults in our world today? There are false teachers in our world today who will try to tell you that Jesus Christ was not physically literally resurrected from the dead because Tommy they can't handle 
that reality. That, that's too far for them. That's too long a stretch. Their faith cannot quite reach out that far and believe that somehow a flesh and blood form that had died, whose heart had discontinued functioning, whose brain functions had stopped, whose blood had stopped flowing, that somehow that body was reanimated and brought back to the fullness of life. And I must tell you, I've got to I gotta help you understand something. I grew up in Pentecost, and I'll tell you, there's a lot of stuff. It's not, it's not unusual, the Pentecostal doctrine. It's, it's part and parcel of much of Christendom. But there are certain things that don't make any sense and kind of annoy me to no end about beliefs within the church. There are many who want to believe you, tell you that Jesus Christ was fully literally physically resurrected from the dead and yet he ran around with holes in his side and he ran around with holes in his hands and he ran around folks i got news for you jesus christ was resurrected from the dead in order for that body then to be able to sustain life once again that body had to be healed it had to be restored hallelujah when god resurrects from the dead he doesn't resurrect a beat up, torn up flesh and blood form that looks like a big old piece of meat that's been tortured. Mm -hmm. That's why the apostles had such a hard time. The disciples of Christ had such a hard time accepting that he had risen because they saw him beaten. They saw him scorched. They saw the hairs of his face. The word of God said that the soldiers literally reached and grabbed the hairs of his beard and pulled it out of his face. The word of God describes him as not even resembling a human form by the time they had finished torturing him. If you think God resurrected that form, and it continued to look like that, you're out of your bloody, stinking mind. No, when Jesus Christ was resurrected, when he was in effect born again, he had a healed form. He had a restored form. Hallelujah. He looked like the old Jesus that they had always known and they had always recognized. And that's why they, for the life of them, they, they put their eyes on it and said, no, no, that, that, that can't be him because because the, the, the Jesus I knew, I saw him tortured. I saw his beard pulled from his face. I saw a crown of thorns planted upon his head. I saw them beat him with a cat of nine tails. I saw him crucified. I saw the nails go through his hands. And finally, I saw the spear in his side. How, how in the world could this possibly be Jesus? Jesus was the first fruit of those of us today that believe the gospel. His resurrection from the dead is a type of our resurrection from the dead of sin and unbelief. Honey, God don't resurrect you to look like the same old dead thing you were. Hallelujah. No, if any man be in Christ, he is what a new creature. Former things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. But it was that body that came out of the tomb. It was not another body. It was not a new creation that God made. No, but God resurrected that same body and He restored it and He healed it so that it could once again sustain life. If somebody dropped dead because you shot a hole in their head with a forty-five shotgun, and God restored them to life, how could they continue to live and to function and to breathe and to think and to do what they need to do if they continue to have a hole in their head that's pouring out blood and if their brain continues to have the damage done to it that was done by the bullet? It, it couldn't happen. Do you understand what I'm telling you? 
This is one of the mistakes that Christianity has long made. You know, we want to believe that when the Lord was resurrected, it's funny, they don't claim he still had the marks of the thorns in his head. They don't claim that he still has uh, the stripes upon his back. No, all we hear them claim is that, well, he still had the nail prints in his hands and he still has the nail prints in his feet. He still has the hole in his side. No, he was restored to new life. That body was healed. It was delivered. It was restored. But we live in a miserable world. We live in a world that is full of sadness. We live in a world that is full of sorrow. We live in a world that is full of greed and avarice, and envy, and murder, and strife, and conflict, pain, depression, oh dear God, malice. We live in a world where men will fight one another to the death for power, for influence, for money, for wealth. They'll fight to the death over land. They'll fight to the death over positions. There are coups that take place all over the world because someone wants to control the levers of power. And they're willing to kill in order to obtain those levers. And I tell the truth today. We live in a miserable, miserable world. I'm telling you, I've never been so miserable in this life as I have been since a certain clown was elected president of the United States. My heart has never been more broken since it's been since the most evil man to ever occupy the White House has taken the controls of power, the levers of power here in the United States of America. My heart is heartbroken when I see the hardship when I see the difficulty, when I see the hatefulness, I see the racism, the xenophobia, the homophobia that is being once again made part of our national fabric. All because of the influence of one man whom I believe to be demonically possessed and demonically influenced. We live in a miserable world, folks. But the Apostle Paul said in the 18th verse, 19th verse, I'm sorry, of our primary text today, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But you know, in spite of Trump, in spite of McConnell, in spite of the GOP, in spite of what's happening in our country today, I'm not at all miserable. Because my hope in Christ goes far beyond this world. Hallelujah. It goes far beyond what's happening in this earth. Listen, if Jesus promised us eternal life and that life were merely a continuation of what we have now, who on earth would want it? Makes me laugh how many people will struggle and struggle. Man, they'll try to eat all the right foods. They'll go to the gym every day. They'll do all the exercises. They'll take all the supplements and all the vitamins and the minerals and they'll drink their green tea and they'll do their, uh, uh, you know, colonics and they'll do all they can do so that they can live as long as they possibly can live. Why? Why? I'll tell you why. Because the only hope they have is in this life. They don't understand Christ our Lord is risen today. 
Hallelujah. We have a hope that goes beyond this world. Hallelujah. And we have a hope today, folks, that goes far beyond eternal life. It goes far beyond the notion of eternal existence. We're not going to exist eternally in a life and in an existence that resembles what we're going through now. Who on earth would want this garbage? I wouldn't. I wouldn't want an eternity of what we have here, would you? But we got scientists fighting every day to try to learn how to make people live longer, try to help people live longer. Oh, we want people to be able to live hundreds of years. Why? As a child of God, I'm not going to run out and kill myself so I can get to heaven sooner. I know better than that. But I can tell you this, when my hour comes, I will welcome that hour. With as much gladness, I will welcome that hour with as much hope. I will welcome that hour with as much positivity as I would welcome the return of the Lord Jesus Christ in the eastern sky. Because one six, the other's half a dozen. Hallelujah. Amen. It doesn't bother me one way or the other. If I make heaven by reason of death's door, if I make heaven by reason of the rapture, either way, I'm going to make heaven. Hallelujah. Either way, I'm going to be in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, I'm far from miserable today. I'm far from miserable because my hope goes far beyond this life. Hallelujah. I have a hope today of heaven. Say, well, bless God, that's all you Christians ever talk about is that you have a hope of heaven. Well, that's all many Christians talk about, but that's not what this preacher is going to talk about today. I have a hope that goes far beyond this life. I have a hope that includes... An existence free from pain. An existence free from death. An existence free from sorrow. An existence free, listen to me children, from greed. An existence free from envy. An existence free from murder. An existence free from theft. An existence free from all the negative things that humanity seems to enjoy visiting upon other human beings. All of these things are not going to be part of God's heaven. They're not going to be part of God's eternity. Oh, my hope goes far beyond this life. It goes way beyond anything that even resembles this life. And that's why today, in spite of everything and everyone, I am not at all miserable. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you today, you're not going to have to worry about trying to do business with somebody in God's heaven and have to worry about them trying to do you dirty. Because that won't be part of our eternity. I have a hope today. I have a hope today that there's coming a day when never again will I ever have to wrestle with that demon called depression. I'll never again have to deal with despondency or despair. Never again will I have to know what it is to be lonely. Never again will we have to deal with being afraid. Or distressed. Every experience we'll have, everything we'll do, everywhere we'll go, listen to me, will be pleasant and pleasurable. Hallelujah! Because God has promised to make a new heaven.
and a new earth. Glory to God. He has promised to restore not only humanity by reason of the cross and the tomb and the resurrection, not only has He restored humanity to a rightful place in Him, but He has promised that He would restore the entirety of planet Earth. So that one day, from sea to shining sea, as the old saying goes, the entire planet will resemble what once was only a small tiny dot on the face of the globe. The entire planet will resemble the Garden of Eden. The entire planet will be a Garden of Eden. The entire planet will be a place of pleasures. Hallelujah. That's what Jesus Christ has promised. That is the hope that I have. That one day this entire globe is going to be restored. Why? I'll tell you why. Because for God so loved the world. He can't just restore us and leave the world in the condition that we've left it. No, no, no. He's got to fix everything we broke. He's got to restore everything we've messed up. Hello now. Amen. I want to tell you today, oh, I am not at all miserable. I'm not at all miserable. Jesus Christ is risen today. Hallelujah. And because He's risen, I have a hope that goes far beyond this world. I want to tell you, if you focus your vision and you focus everything on this life and this whole lousy world. It didn't start out lousy, but we messed it up. Mm -hmm. If you focus your sights on this world and what this world has to offer, and if you are of the mindset today like so many I know uh, who claim to be agnostic or who claim to be atheistic, and they focus on this life because they believe they only get one ride on the roller coaster and they just have to enjoy it the best they can. Man, I'm going to tell you, some of the most miserable people I know, listen to me now, some of the most miserable people I know are people who believe that all we have is what we have now. Am I telling the truth? Yeah. Some of the most miserable people I know are people who believe that this life is all we've got. And they're constantly wishing and hoping they could change circumstances. Oh, they're constantly... I'm going to tell you, I did not like when... I'm going to tick off some people, but if you'll hush your mouth long enough and listen to everything I have to say instead of jumping up and starting to scream and holler, you might learn something. I did not like Barack Obama's first election campaign. It bothered me immensely that there were pictures of him that were kind of resemblant of the uh, Andy Warhol prints of, you know, Marilyn Monroe and what have you. They kind of looked like that. And they'd have the word hope beneath his image. No, Barack Obama wasn't our hope. He never was our hope. He'll never be our hope. Because in this life, any change that comes, Donald Trump has proven can be unchanged and undone. Am I telling the truth? Right. Anything that happens in this life is subject to being undone and is subject to being reversed. So therefore, to paint uh, Barack Obama as our hope to me was an idiotic and asinine stupid function. I didn't like it. I didn't like it when I saw it. I said, Lord Jesus, the only hope we have is you. There is no man on this planet that is a hope for us. There is not a man on this planet that if they're a hope for anything, they're a hope for a momentary respite, but they're not a hope of anything permanent. So why in the world would we paint a man as our hope? No, I want to tell you today, my hope goes so far beyond this life. Glory to God, I know that one day I'm going to leave this old body behind. 
It's not going to disappear, and I'm not going to take on a new body. No, God is going to transform this body. That's what the Word of God tells us. The dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to join them in the clouds. And it tells us that we shall be changed. So it's not an issue of the body we have is simply going to drop to the ground and our spirit is going to rise to meet the Lord. No, our body's coming with us. But that body is going to be changed because no human body, the Word of God tells us, can live in the presence of God. Therefore, we must be restored to that condition that Adam had before the fall. What does the Word of God tell us about Adam's condition before the fall? The Word of God tells us that God breathed into Adam's nostrils and Adam became what? A living soul. What can stand in the presence of God is a living soul, not a body. Therefore, we must take on our spiritual form, our spiritual body. Uh, guess what your soul is, folks? It's your spiritual form. It's your spiritual body. The Apostle Paul said, now there is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. What is that spiritual body? It is your soul. Amen. So therefore, we are able to live and stand in the presence of God. The Word of God said, we shall see Him as He is. This is something that no human being has ever been able to do. Because as the Lord told Moses, He said, if you were to see me as I am, you would drop to the ground dead. You could not stand it in your human form. You couldn't do it. But as a living soul, will be able to live and walk in the presence of God. If you remember, the, the Word of God tells us that in the uh, Garden of Eden, uh, the Lord used to come down and walk with Adam in the cool of the day. That would not have been possible if Adam were at that moment in a human body. No, he had to exist as a living soul in order for that to happen. Because if he were in a body, then unless God's a liar... Because the Word of God said no man had seen God at any time. Hello now. Mm -hmm. So obviously if God came down into the garden, if Adam was able to hide from God after he had disobeyed the Lord and ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, if he was able to hide from the Lord, then he must have had some sort of visual acuity. He must have had some sort of a visual cue. He was able somehow to see God in order to try to hide himself from the Lord. But his existence prior to the fall was different than its existence after the fall. That's why the Word of God said that God sending His Son in the form, in the likeness of sinful flesh. Because flesh was our punishment. Flesh was not, not so much our punishment, but it was the curse that came upon us. When Adam forfeited his existence, having been made in the image and likeness of God. God is not a man. But He was made in the image and likeness of God. He was made a living soul. He had a spiritual form. When He disobeyed God, He became fallen man. Now, God said, now, when you experience plowing the fields, you're going to sweat. Now, when you prick your hand upon a pricker, it's going to hurt and you're going to bleed. Why? Because prior to that, prickers didn't hurt. Prior to that, heat didn't affect them. No, because their form had changed. They had taken on, you want to live like a natural beast. You want to be able to follow your natural inclination. You want to be able to do what your flesh dictates like the cows do, like the zebras do, like the giraffes do. Then you have to live in existence as they do, and they live as animals. That's why human beings with flesh are classified scientifically as what? Animals. We have a similar nature as the animals. We're flesh and blood as the animals. Animals bleed red too, don't they? Amen. I want to tell you today, I am far from miserable. Hallelujah. I am far from miserable. Oh, I look forward to the day when no more will I have to worry about human leaders 
enacting policies that visit pain and heartbreak upon other human beings. No longer will I have to worry about human leaders who are willing to separate families who have come to our country in hopes of finding a better life and escaping the torments of the lands from which they come. No longer will I have to worry about prison systems that abuse all of those who are in prison and treat them like animals and mistreat them and abuse them. It is sickening and sad the way that people in jails and in prisons are treated. The same person that writes a bad check is treated no better than a person who's murdered a hundred people. The jailers take pleasure in visiting hurtful behavior upon them and speaking nasty, hateful, hurtful words to them. Oh, I'm telling you folks, humanity is a disgusting race when you really look at it. If you look at it careful, if in this life we have hope, my God, then I am of all men most miserable. But I'm not at all miserable. I'm not at all miserable. Why? Because I know that because Jesus Christ has risen from the dead, I know that one day every man, every woman, every boy, every girl will stand before Him in judgment. Oh, I have hope that goes far beyond this world. You see, I'd be miserable like some of my atheist friends too if I believed that this life was all there was. But you know what, Tommy? I know good and well that one day Donald Trump is going to answer for every hateful, malicious, evil, nasty thing he has ever done. Every person he's ever cheated, every person he has ever stolen from, every person his policies as a leader of this nation has hurt and wounded, he's going to answer to God for. And he will receive a just reward for that action. Because God is a just God. I have hope today because I know that our existence as human beings goes far beyond the 70, 80, 90 years that we may enjoy on the face of planet earth. I know that we are spiritual beings that are merely going through an earthly journey. A lot of people don't recognize that. A lot of people don't want to accept that fact. But see, I have hope because I know that to be true. I know that to be true. I have hope that the Adolf Hitlers of this world are going to pay for the evil they visited upon the human race. Mm -hmm. I know that the Genghis Khans, I know that the evil men of history, the Jack the Rippers, are going to pay for their sins and there will be divine justice. And that justice will be eternal. Why will it be eternal? It's not going to just merely be a momentary thing. Why will it be eternal? Because whether they wanted to recognize it or not, the truth is we are spiritual beings living in earthly existence. If they want to ignore that fact, if they don't want to accept that fact, God said that's all well and good. But when it comes time for punishment, you're going to realize that you were a spiritual being living in an earthly existence. And when you go into punishment, the Word of God calls it everlasting punishment. Why? Because you're a spiritual being going through an earthly existence. You don't have to accept that fact in the here and now if you don't want to. But honey, i got news for you. It is a fact. And I have hope today because I believe that. I have hope today because I believe with every ounce of my being that Jesus Christ arose from the dead, that He conquered the grave, He conquered hell, He holds the keys today to hell, death, and the grave. And I am far from miserable. I have a hope that goes way beyond this life. It's inclusive of far more than anything that this world offers and anything that this world holds. 
And this afternoon, I want to tell you folks, if you don't know Jesus Christ, if you're not walking in relationship with God, then you may not have this hope. You may still be convinced that you're uh, nothing more than an animal, and just like an animal, when you die, that's all there is, and that's all the existence that you've known, that's all the existence you'll ever know. Well, I'm going to tell you, I feel sorry for you. I pity you. I really do. But if you would understand who Jesus is, if you'd understand what Jesus did, if you'd understand that the God of all creation manifested Himself in human form so that He could do for humanity what humanity was incapable of doing for itself. Humanity needed a second Adam. Jesus Christ is called the second Adam. Well, what was the first Adam? The first Adam was a perfect, sinless creation, was he not? Well, the only problem is the Word of God declares we're born in sin, we're shapen in iniquity. Therefore, how in the world could we get a second Adam? Well, the Bible said Jesus Christ, God sent His Son made in the likeness of sinful flesh. God Himself took on that sinful nature. But the Word of God also tells us in the book of Timothy. He writes to Timothy and said, For without controversy great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit. Meaning what? His Spirit, being God, was perfect. Sinful flesh was wrapped around a perfect spirit, God's spirit, because God, the Word of God declares, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto Himself. So God had to do this. Nobody else could do it. God couldn't create somebody to do it. No, it had to be God Himself. God took on human form. God lived a human existence. He experienced everything from the human perspective. That's why the Word of God declares that we have not a high priest. That Paul uses a double negative. He said we have not a high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. If you do away with the double negative and you simply say it the way it ought to be said, he should have said simply, we have a high priest who can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, who is tempted in all like manner as we, yet without sin. So God Himself took on human form. He walked through this life so that He could understand you and you could understand Him. He went to the cross. The Word of God declares Jesus said, I could have called a legion of angels to rescue me at any moment in time had I wanted to. But He didn't. Because He had a plan. And that plan was in motion, and he knew that plan was the most important thing in eternity. And that one day there would be some of us, I'm among them, who would embrace that plan. Hallelujah, by faith. And he knew that in that plan there was hope for a better, brighter tomorrow. He knew that in that plan there was an acknowledgement and a revelation that we are spiritual beings going through a physical existence. And he knew that in the knowledge that we're spiritual beings going through an earthly existence, that there was hope that after this short portion of our journey was over, this portion we call life, which the Word of God said is a vapor. You know, it's here today and gone tomorrow. He said after this vapor has evaporated, after this short journey is finished, I have a hope today, hallelujah, because of a risen Christ, that there is so much more. It's going to be so much better. Not only is there going to be happiness and joy and peace for those of us that have believed, but we can be 
calmed and we can be assured in the knowledge today, folks, that there will be justice. There will be justice. Nothing that any man or woman has done in this life, in this flesh, nothing is going to go unanswered. Nothing is going to go unpunished. God is going to hold every human being accountable. And this afternoon I encourage you, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. On the day of Pentecost, as the Holy Ghost from heaven was poured out upon the believers in the upper room, some 120 or so, the city of Jerusalem heard a great noise and a lot of commotion and people began to gather and the saints of God from the upper room began to pour out into the streets. And they began to preach and they were preaching under the anointing and the unction of the Holy Ghost and they were speaking languages they had never learned. They were preaching and speaking in languages, glorifying God in languages they had never learned because God by the Holy Ghost had breathed life into their spirit and their soul became alive. And when those that heard them asked the question, men and brethren, what must we do? If you ask me today, Pastor, what must I do to be born again? I'm not going to give you the same answer that... Franklin Grant gives you because it's not a biblical answer. You don't pray the sinner's prayer. Nowhere in the Word of God do you ever one time see anyone leading anyone in a sinner's prayer. Never do you one time see offered as an answer, what must I do to be saved? Never do you see the answer given, pray this prayer after me. That is a false doctrine. It is a false belief. What is the truth? I'll tell you the truth. The Word of God says on the day of Pentecost, that's the birthday of the church. Jews and Gentiles began to gather around the upper room and hearing the people preach the Word of God said, they asked Peter and the others, well, men and brethren, what must we do? You're telling us about this Jesus who died. You're telling us about this Jesus who rose from the dead, but... What do we have to do? I can believe what you're saying, but how do I respond to that belief? Because according to James, the brother of Jesus, faith without works, faith without action is dead, being alone. I've, somehow i got to put feet to my faith. What do I do? You're telling me the house is on fire. What do I do? Well, get out of the house. You follow what I'm saying? The Word of God said, then said Peter unto them, Repent which means turn around. Turn from unbelief to belief. Turn from a lack of faith to faith in God. Trust God. Believe God. Repent. Turn around. Repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. I'm going to tell you folks, Peter couldn't have made it any simpler. He explained who needed to be baptized. He explained how they needed to be baptized. He explained why they needed to be baptized. Who? Every one of you. How? In the name of Jesus Christ. Why? For the remission of sins. You can't make it any clearer than that. He then said, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Why? Because this promise is unto you and to your children and to them that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. That is why in the 21st century we Pentecostals still preach the baptism of the Holy Ghost because this promise, Peter said, is unto you and to your children and to them that are afar off. He's crossing generations. He said, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. So everyone that God calls to salvation, He also calls to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. 
And I want to tell you today, God wants to make Himself real to you. The risen Christ wants to make Himself real to you. How does God make Himself real to you? I'll tell you how. Not simply by reason of, oh, well, I believe on Him. I believe this story of the Gospel. That's not how He makes Himself real to you. He makes Himself real to you by pouring His Spirit into you. And when His Spirit is poured into you, your spiritual man comes to life. Hallelujah. And your spiritual man begins to breathe. And your spiritual man experiences new life and resurrection. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you today, I'm not at all miserable. Hallelujah. My hope goes far beyond this life. Which is, stand with me this afternoon. I'm trying to keep my...